Thank you for joining us tonight for Singray's webinar of the month. Today, we are talking about a brand new filter that Singray worked with Brian Hansel to create. It's the Singray Brian Hansel all-in-one filter. And we're gonna hear tonight from Brian Hansel, of course, about this filter. Uh, by way of introduction, Brian is an award-winning professional landscape pr photographer and outdoor educator. He has over 30 years of photography experience with over 100 publication credits from publications such as National Geographic, Outdoor Photographer, Lake Superior Magazine, Ocean Paddler, Canoe and Kayak Magazine, Backpacker Magazine, and many more. In 2018, he received the Lake Times Magazine's Best Photographer in Minnesota Award. An outdoor educator and guide at heart, Brian decided to share his passion for outdoor photography and started a photography workshop program in 2006. His programs take students to the best and often unknown locations in the Northland and across the nation to many national parks. He lives in Grand Marais, Minnesota, Connie LeMay, the editor of Lake Superior Magazine, has said about his work, his photography expresses his love and concern for our wild spaces and delicate environments. He's one of a handful of photographers with whom we can, with whom we work, who can literally translate emotions into their images. The joy of continued discovery comes out in Brian's work. He may have shot the same scenic area a dozen or more times, but every image speaks to a new way of seeing or of something freshly seen. So Brian, we are so excited. This is the second filter that Singray has uh, developed with your help. And we're, I can't wait to hear from the source where the idea came from and, and where you see it being used. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to talking about it tonight. So, um, and I got lots to say because I'm long winded. So <laughs> everybody better be prepared. So we'll start the uh, presentation. This is just an introduction to the all-in-one filter. Um, and so we're gonna kind of keep it basic and leave a lot of room for questions. So just I'm gonna describe what the all-in-one filter is, talk about why I designed it, why I felt I, there was a need for it, and then how to use the all-in-one filter. And then I'll answer any questions that you have about the filter, or if you just have other questions, I'm happy to answer those as well. First, we're gonna start off on a video here. So this is just a promo video for the all-in-one filter that I threw together today. And something to remember when you're watching this video is um, every time that you see a panning shot of the filter, just imagine that the filter is on the front of my camera in a location that I couldn't go in 2020 because I was stuck in uh, Cook County, Minnesota all year as we were all stuck home. So keep that in mind. And um, I hope that you find the music extremely epic and fun. All right. Well, I hope some of you have a little bit of humor on that one. Um, I just, I get a kick out of that every time I hear, hear that music on it. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I threw it together today. I, I felt like we needed a little, uh, a little uh, epic music at the beginning here. <laughs> so. All right. Um, so what I uh, so what is the all-in-one filter? So the easiest way to describe it, and I'll show you a picture in just a second, is it's a split neutral density graduated filter. And it started when um, I wanted a filter that combined a three-stop reverse with a two-stop soft, which is like a combination that I use all the time. Um, and then, but, but it, the, that combo wasn't doing exactly what I wanted it to do. So it was a little bit different. Um, 
so what what we did is we modified that we use this as a starting point the two to three stop reverse uh or and then modified from there so this uh picture actually has the filter in it uh and it's a good example if you've ever shot at this location in the smoky mountains um this is the kind of loop the overlook uh you know like once that the sun hits the horizon the shot's over and i've just never gotten a good starburst there um on a clear day on uh, cloudy days it actually works pretty well but with the filter it gives you the ability to get like a lot of detail in the foreground and still get a starburst you're still going to get flare at that overlook i don't i've never not gotten flare at that overlook but um uh it turned out pretty good i thought so here's what the all-in-one looks like so it's split right in the center and right at this point it becomes a four stop filter so right here it's four stops then there's a soft transition into that hard um, hard transition. And this goes from zero to about 1.5 stops, maybe a little bit less than 1.5 stops. And then at the top, it fades off like a reverse down to about one stop. Um, so it's pretty complicated as far as the different transitions, uh, but, but easy to use as you'll see uh, later in the video. So, and... Um, you know, this this wonderful photo of this filter was shot in my basement office in Minnesota. So there was a location marker on the slide. So I decided to fill that one in. So why design the all-in-one filter? Uh, so so this happened out in the Badlands. Um, so I, Badlands of South Dakota. Uh, and I shoot into the sunrise and sunset quite often. And out there, you're shooting like up high across these formations as you see here you're at the top you're at the top of the formation shooting across them and then when you're shooting into the sunrise and sunset this whole area gets very very dark uh, so i found that like i was i was stacking filters one right after another and eventually i came up with the idea that uh if i put a three stop reverse along the horizon here and then dropped a two stop soft down below it I could actually get a lot of detail here and then it would look the net the transition would look a lot more natural than using like a three stop reverse and a two stop reverse which technically was a little bit darker but it always looked fake to me so having the two stop soft down below it transitioned into that three stop reverse and, and it was working pretty well but the problem for me is um all my filter holders are set up just for two slots so I don't get vignetting on the really wide angle lenses. Like right now I have a Z7 and I shoot like a 14 to 24 to eight, their new 14 to 24 to eight. When you put a filter on that, you can, for the hundred millimeter filters, there's a couple adapters out there. When you put that hundred millimeter filters in there, you can only get two filters in. Uh, and I've run into that problem in the past when you're shooting at like 16 millimeters, having three filters on the front of your camera. Um, ends up getting a little bit of vignetting when you're that wide. The other thing that I'm really bad at is cleaning my filters so and my lenses. So when I put more filters in front of it, if I have smudges or dust on there, I always get these like little spots. And I notice like if I have multiple filters on there, um, I'm going to have more of them. And now I know that that is my fault and everybody else in the audience probably cleans their filters way more than I do. Um, so... Uh, anyways, that's, that's one of the issues too, of using multiple different filters. So as you're, um, talking, we're, we're, about, as you're talking about the transitions being soft or hard, um, do you want to talk a little bit more about what that means? Soft sure. Yeah, I'll go back. Yeah. So a hard, so when we're looking at a split neutral density graduated filter, a hard transition would be very abrupt. So you go from clear to very dark almost instantly. So if you look right where the laser pointer is on the slide, uh, that would be an abrupt hard transition. A soft transition is where it gradually goes from clear to dark. If you look like right here on the slide, you can see, um, see it transitioning from clear to getting a little bit more density up towards the hard transition. So that would be the soft. It just softly glows, goes from clear to dark and the hard is just an abrupt transition from clear to dark. And then what the reverse is, so the, the other terminology is reverse. Um, and the reverse is it just tapers off the further it gets away from the center line. So you're the darkest at the center 
and then it starts to taper off and get um, lighter towards the top of the filter. Those are kind of like the three um, main transitions that you could get into is like the hard filters, the reverse filters, and the soft filters. Uh, and the all-in-one combines the hard transition, a reverse transition, and a soft transition into one. Hopefully that uh, it clears that up a little bit. That was a good way of describing it. Yeah, so here's another example of what I was running into when I would shoot in the Badlands. In the Badlands, I, I used to live in Rapid City, so I, I sh used to shoot out there a lot. And then um, it's about 12 hour drive from my house and it's south of where I live. So I live in way Northern Minnesota. So going to the Badlands in like February or March, um, uh, that, that's like going on summer vacation because it's nice and warm down there. You, you get like 20 degree days instead of negative 40 degree days. Um, in the park, so I used to shoot there a lot, not, not as much anymore, but this is the this, this similar situation where you're standing up on top of the Badland formations and you're looking down into that deep canyon and then the sun is typically rising on the other side of the formations. Uh, so everything down in here in the middle of the shot ends up completely black without the filters. So I would just be stacking filter after filter, just trying to um, get some detail back in here. And just to give you an example of what that um, looks like is like this. So this would be what it would look like without a filter out there straight out of the camera. And um, it's just that you can see that it's just extremely dark in here. So the idea is to darken the sky down um, with using one of those ND grad filters and then the all in one has the hard transition right along the horizon darkening the sky and then the soft transition starts below and you end up like this where you where you start to get the detail and this is the same composition as the last one here so they're exactly the same composition and you can see uh, how much more detail we get into the foreground with the all in one So we, you know, this is um, the Badlands is, is just notorious for this. Unless you have a lot of filtering on, you're just not going to get very much detail through here. And this is just another example of it where um, this is when I was using the two different filters, the three stop reverse would go right across the horizon. And you can see the two stop soft hanging down here. I don't know if everybody can make that out or not. I'll try to zoom in a little bit on this. Uh, but you can see that the soft is starting here because you can see the tonal values or how white the snow is right there. And then as it goes further to the horizon, the, the white starts to turn a little bit darker um, until it gets right at the horizon. That's the soft filter um, transitioning to the horizon to help hide that reverse in there. So I, I use that a lot in the Badlands. And at the same time, I was shooting at um, Theodore Roosevelt National Park, uh, which has a similar features. They're not quite the, the bad. So that is a Badlands location. Um, and, and the Badland features are more smooth, maybe a little bit more lush up there. So I decided to try it there anyway. So this is like the classic shot uh, over the Little Missouri River. Um, from like the, I think it's wind cave is what they call this. And I decided to put that three stop reverse and two stop combo into practice here. And, I, you know, I wasn't really surprised that it worked, but I was kind of surprised that it worked. Like here was the second location that this thing that I was using down in Badlands was working at. So I started to use it in all kinds of different locations. So out in the Tetons, so I'm out in the Tetons, and if you've ever shot the barn, the famous barn out there, um, at sunset, it's nearly impossible to get detail in the barn and still have detail in the sky at sunset. I mean, this is ex extreme contrast here, and it's far beyond the contrast that any of our cameras can capture without using the filters. Uh, and the way that I used to shoot this is I would just put a couple multiple soft filters in there, which, which worked okay, but because the, the reverse filter was working so well at Teddy Roosevelt and at the Badlands, I decided one day I would come in and I would put a reverse filter in right along the horizon, um, just at the top of the mountains. And then I would take that two stop soft and I would hang it down and see what happened. 
And surprisingly, the transition between the soft and the reverse just disappeared. You can't really see it in the shot anymore. I was like, wait a second, this is interesting to me. It's really working in the mountains. So I tried it a bunch of other locations the year that the first year that I tried it out in the Tetons and it, it worked. It worked almost at every spot. Um, so the, the third location that I shoot a lot is, is by where I live. So I live in um, Cook County, Minnesota, which is in northern Minnesota. It's along the lakes, uh, the, the shoreline of Lake Superior. It butts up against Canada. And we have a, a large chunk of the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness um, in our county. And I, I'm a canoeist uh, and a kayaker. So I shoot a lot of canoe shots and a lot of kayak shots. Um, and it's like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out and try this. So I got home from the Tetons that year and I hauled my canoe up to this spot. This is uh, one of my favorite places to test filters at actually, cause it's very accessible. You can drive right up to here and you get these beautiful islands out on the horizon. Um, the rivers uh, or the uh, lake is called Devil Track Lake. So it's kind of an unfortunate name. Um, I'm gonna do a tangent cause it's an interesting story. There was a, a vet from the Civil War who uh, left the East Coast and came out here to be a hermit and live by himself on Devil Track Lake. He had lost a leg in the Civil War. Uh, so he wore um, a peg leg and then in the winter he would have a snowshoe on one leg and then a peg on the other and everybody just started calling it his, his tracks, the Devil's Tracks. And that's how they, the lake got named. Uh, true story. But at any rate, the, the two stop or the three stop reverse with the two stop soft actually worked extremely well in water because when you're shooting over water, what happens when you're using a three or four stop filter, which uh, uh, it darkens the sky down a lot, but it doesn't darken the water out. So you end up getting very bright water um, and a dark sky, which is actually unnatural. So typically the water is either the same tonal value or close to the same tonal value as the sky or maybe even slightly darker than what the sky would be. Um, so that the, the combo here got rid of that. Uh, and then, you know, so I was like, you know, I want this filter. I want a filter that combines both of them because I was always putting the two filters in not only took extra time, it took an extra slot on my uh, filter holder. Um, and and I like a lot of times to blur the water. It's, you're not seeing it in here. This is just naturally calm that day. But you'll see some shots where I blur the water by putting in a more slow filter. So I use like a five stop and a 10 stop more slow filter a lot. So what I was finding with the two slots that I have on my lens, I wasn't able to do the three stop reverse, the two stop soft, and the more slow together in one filter. So what I want to do is walk through some examples of um, some before and after pictures and then some different shots showing where the filter was used just so everybody can see what this filter can do. So this is uh, one of the early prototypes. I, I forget how many prototypes we went through, but it took us a, a, a number of years and probably around 12 prototypes to get it right. Um, and this was one of the early ones where I really saw the potential of the filter. So we're in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. We're about two, maybe three days into um, a seven day trip on a remote lake on an island. This is my favorite campsite in all of the Boundary Waters. And if you don't know what the Boundary Waters is, it's a, a million acres of wilderness area that's devoted to canoeing. So there's a, um, I think that it's a, a I want to say a thousand lakes, two thousand lakes. I used to know all the statistics. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but uh, the lakes are interconnected by trails called portages. So you you paddle down one lake, pick up all your gear, and haul it all across this portage to the next lake. And then there's campsites everywhere along the way. So there's you know thousands of miles of canoe trails in the Boundary Waters, and it's um uh, it's it's the U.S.'s most popular wilderness area. Uh, and it's about 10 minutes from my house, so I'm lucky to live up here. But this is this is um, you know kind of the break in of the of the filter. I think it was even the first one. And we went in the Boundary Waters, and I used it this morning. And this was the first morning I used it, and it blew my mind away. Like that's an unbelievably good shot. Typically, if you use like a three stop reverse, the the water wouldn't have any color in it. Um, it would be kind of washed out. Uh, you'd have real dark sky, but a little bit washed out water. And then you'd have to come in in your editing program and darken the water down to make it, you know, look natural. But on top of that, 
this canoe is black and we I got detail. This is all carbon fiber canoe and um, there's detail in the canoe and the ground and all created by that all in one filter. And I was just absolutely amazed the first shot that I, that I saw come out of the camera. Um, and if, if you're actually interested more in learning about this particular photo, um, I was on behind the shot and we, we talked for about an hour about making this shot and what goes into making landscape shots. So the link is right here, but if you just go to like behind the shot TV and you search for Hansel, it's the only one that pops up. Um, so if you're interested in that, that's fun. I shot this one with a Sony and a Battis. Um, so this was the 18 millimeter Battis lens from Sony, uh, which is, is crazy sharp. This thing is, is a wild lens. If you're a Sony user, you should, should own this lens if you shoot their mirrorless cameras. So we have a question from Sandra and she wants to know how well does a filter like this work if you want to smooth out water during midday um, or is a 10 stop a better fit? Yeah, it's a, it's a does two different things. So what this filter is going to do for you is darken the sky. Um, it's not necessarily going to smooth that water out. It will give you a little bit of a longer exposure than without having the filter on it. Um, but for smoothing water in midday, you're gonna want like a 10 or 15 stop more slow. And if it's like a bright sunny day, I would definitely get the 15 stop over the 10 because it will just blur the water a lot more. The 10 stop will get you in to a couple seconds where the 15 might get you out to a minute or so. And then Gary had a question. I think he's talking about stacking. Gary, if you're not, let me know. Um, he said, where the filter ends at the bottom, do you see the cutoff of the filter on the bottom of your photos? Um, you don't because they're long enough that even when you're shooting vertical, um, and I can't, let me see if I have a vertical shots here. So even when you're shooting vertical with very little sky in it, the filter's long enough to get down below your picture. So you'll never see that cut off. Um, if I go back to the, the picture of the, let me just get out of this and go back to it. So that, that filter transition, I, I wanna say that's 75 millimeters or so um, from this spot down to here. So it's, it's plenty, even the um, logo, which is right on the bottom, that never shows up because it's never in your shot um, because it's far enough down on the filter that it's just not gonna, not going to interfere. So it's not, not an issue you have to worry about. Right. And then do more filters or very dark filters affect the digital SLRs autofocus? Uh, depends on your camera. Typically what I've seen for most of the uh, cameras out there is a five stop. You can still focus through that unless it's a very old um, camera. Right. So if you have like a 10 year old camera, you're probably going to have some issues. Um, if it's a more recent camera, it's going to focus through a five, no problem. The 10 stop at sunrise and sunset, uh, your, most cameras I, won't be able to focus through that. Um, at midday, there's a good chance with a 10 filter, 10 stop filter that you'll be able to focus through it if you have a modern um, focusing system. But I would count on the 10 stops that you do focus before you put the filter in your camera. Um, and then, uh, so, so focus on where you need to focus in the scene, turn off your focus system, put the 10 stop filter in and then take your picture. And that way, you know, if you're using autofocus, you'll get, you'll get it um, before the filter goes in. So the camera won't have to deal with it. And then for metering, do you meter the foreground and then install the filter? So for this particular filter, the all-in-one, the camera is able to meter through it. Uh, so you don't have to meter the foreground or do anything different than you would typically meter. Awesome. And then I'm, I use the histogram. So I've, I've used mirrorless now and um, I have a live view histogram. So uh, I just make sure that my histogram goes almost all the way to the right-hand side without going past it for metering. So here's some more examples. So this is an example of um, on the left right here. This is uh, this is the edited shot. So this is after I've gone into Lightroom and edited. This is the scene with no filter. And then this is the scene with all in one filter straight out of the camera. So you can see it side by side. What I did in the field is uh, I just took my histogram and I, I should have um, I should have pasted it in, but I moved it to the right in this 
photo so that I wouldn't blow out any details, but I wanted it as far right as possible so I would capture the maximum amount of information throughout the entire picture. And I did the same here. So I, so I did my metering exactly the same, moved the histogram to the same point. And you can see even without editing in Lightroom, it brings in a significant amount of detail in your foreground. Whereas without the filter, we're just gonna have this black blob, which uh, to me is not a very appealing photo. Uh, but over here, this is appealing because we can see like the detail in the foreground. We can see the puddle here um, and the shapes of the basalt. So this is uh, called breakwater basalt on Lake Superior. And it's um, you know some of the oldest basalt on earth that's exposed. So you get this kind of really cool weathering effect, both from the lake, but also the glaciers that moved over this area, um, left some cool marks. Here's some other here's some other examples. So these are all unedited shots. So in this case, what I wanted to show is here here it is with the all in one. So this is just shot with the all in one. Here's no filter, but I exposed so the canoe would be the same intensity as the canoe was in the all in one filter. And then this shot here was shot so that the sky would be approximately the same intensity as the all-in-one filter. So you could see the difference between exposing for the sky, exposing for the foreground. Without the filter, you can't make it happen. And then with the filter, um, you get the detail both in the sky and the ground. And then the water actually looks pretty natural instead of overly bright. Like uh, if you had a four-stop um, reverse right here, which is a, a you know, it would be a, a doable filter in this situation. The water would be very bright and look not quite natural. So now I'll show these same three, but edited. So now I went into Lightroom and just did some simple edits on it. Here's the edited all in one, which I think looks pretty good. So we have detail throughout. We can um, see some of the sunlight kissing the fog in the background, uh, some nice uh, orange glow here on the horizon. The green grass is popping out. With the filter that, or with the shot that was exposed for the foreground, the sky is just completely gone. There's no detail in the clouds and there was no way to get it back. That was the best that I could do out of that file. And then in the deep, or in this shot, I, I tried to match the same edits on here, just so you could see. Now in theory, I could have probably brightened up this foreground more in the shot, but what ends up happening is in the dark areas, uh, as you bring out shadow detail, it gets pretty noisy. Um, so it would be the equivalent in this, in this scene right here, if I brightened up all of this dark detail, it would probably be the equivalent of shooting at 3,200 ISO, maybe 6,400 ISO. I haven't done it, so I don't know if, which one it would be, but if you ever shot at 3,200 or 6,400 ISO, it can look very, very noisy. Uh, so you end up without using the filter, your shadows get just that that staticky kind of noise in it, and it doesn't look very good, particularly at uh, on prints, on large prints. So here's some more from uh, more shots showing what the reverse and the all-in-one, the differences between the two are. And you're gonna have to excuse like the, the wave difference here. Um, by the time I got the reverse on, the, uh, it was hard to keep this in place. So the waves are covering up a little bit of the sand and rocks on the beach, so it looks not as contrasty here, but that's just because there's extra water in this situation. And, and the reverse, it's just dark right here. So it's three stops. It doesn't have that soft transition below it like the all-in-one has. Um, so you can see th that issue that I've been talking about where the water is brighter uh, than the sky. And once we get the uh, all-in-one on there, it gets, it, it starts to darken down that water. So it actually works really well on water in addition to in the badlands and in the mountains um, where I actually dreamed it up. And so for me, like my, my most favorite thing to do is shoot over water. So I'd shoot a lot of seascapes mainly because I live on Lake Superior. Uh, but when I travel, I try to get to the oceans uh, as well. Um, and then I shoot a lot of canoe and kayak stuff. Um, so this is an important that, it, or, or for me being able to, to work in these situations uh, made it an even better filter that was worthwhile pursuing even further. So here's what that shot looks like edited with a better wave. So this was probably the best wave I got that morning. And um, I don't know if anybody does this, but one of the things that I'll do is I'll shoot um, 30, 40 shots of the same composition, just trying to get the right wave. And then I'll, I'll find the right wave and delete the rest of them. 
So we got another example here of no filter. Um, here's a three stop reverse. Here's the all in one and here's the three stop reverse plus two stop soft combo. They're pretty close. We've tweaked, this is a prototype and we tweaked this a little bit so it's slightly different. Um, but I'm gonna put these back to back so you can see see the difference on it. So the difference, um, if you're not noticing, look right here in the scene, right up by the islands here. And you'll see like on the all-in-one, it gets a little bit darker than the soft. So we, we tweaked that transition so it was faster because the soft was going to maybe like, uh, you know, uh, maybe three quarters of a stop to a stop instead of a stop and a half, uh, which is where we were, ended up on the all-in-one. And here's the edited version of that um, of that shot. So how does using this filter compare to shooting HDR? Scott said he's curious how, how that compares. Yeah, I mean, you could come back to, um, if we go back to that canoe uh, bracket kind of shot here, uh, what you could do is you could blend this, this photo and that photo together and use like the sky from here and the canoe foreground and do like an exposure blend or you could do like an hdr or something like that uh and it, it you know for me it just comes down to how i want to personally shoot um i don't like the process of hdr i don't like the multiple shots and having to deal with it at, um in Lightroom or whatever program that you're using, Luminar does a good job with HDR. If you're in, into that, um, uh, I like to. So, so for me, I like to challenge myself to get everything that I can in the field. So I try to get the maximum amount of information I can in a single exposure instead of blending it later. Um, and there's really, you know, no right or wrong. So uh, on that, so you could. You know, if you're into HDR, that's cool. If you're not, that's cool too. Um, and then one of the other issues that you do have with HDR, particularly when you're shooting around water, uh, is that the water moves and it moves between shots. So you can get these kind of ghosting artifacts on HDR, HDR and stuff uh, like that. I used to, I used to shoot real estate. So I started um, my professional career as a real estate photographer. And when I did that, it was HDR shooting. <laughs> so, cause that was just the way that you would go in and, and do it fast because it didn't pay very well. So you want to use, wanted to spend as little time as possible shooting. Well, and then to um, run added here, a big issue with HDR is wind too. So oh yeah. So yeah, same kind of deal with the water, water, anything that moves really yeah. um, is your issue on that, you know, but I, I've seen HDR that I like and I've seen HDR that I don't like. Um, but for me personally, it's just not something that I'm interested in because I like to do it all in one, but yeah. So I hope that answers that question. Um, let's see, we were right here. So the next, um, the next shot here, this is out on Lake Superior, and this is just to show you the difference between the three-stop reverse. This is shot with the three-stop reverse. So the filter um, transition is right here on the horizon. So the three-stop reverse has that abrupt hard transition that transitions to the soft. Uh, but it's very, very hard on the horizon. So you just put it right on the horizon and you can see in the foreground, the water is actually a little bit brighter. So now we're gonna go on to the all-in-one and you see how the water has gotten darker. I'll go between those two slides here so you can see it more. And then the other thing I want you to look at is this foreground that's right, right at the, the basalt, right in the foreground, this dark basalt. And watch what happens as we go from the three-stop reverse to the all-in-one, you'll notice that it gets a lot brighter. See how much brighter that that gets than using the um, just a three-stop reverse. And the reason that that gets brighter is because the all-in-one is actually a four-stop reverse above that hard transition line. Uh, so we get a lot brighter of a foreground out of it. You can see this um, in this next shot a lot. So this is the no filter. Uh, and then this is the all-in-one, and both of them have a five-stop more slow on it. They have the five-stop more slow on it in order to, to smooth out the water here. But we get this uh, nice dark sky and a really, really bright foreground, so it just pops out. But the water um, is about the same tonal value as the skies in this image versus the no filter. You can see how much brighter the sky is to the water, and we get the darker foreground that just doesn't pop out. 
And the reason that you want this kind of bright foreground is because it, it attracts your eyes to it. Um, anytime that you have something bright in your image, that's going to have a lot of visual weight and visual weight attracts your eyes and, and, and calls attention to itself. So in this shot, the foreground is probably what your eye is going to come into, and then it's going to lead your eyes out to the horizon. Whereas in this shot, your eyes end up starting in the sky and they hardly ever come down in the foreground because your eyes tend not to go to the shadows or the dark areas of your shot. So here we are back at Grand Teton National Park where I first tried that the, the combo in the mountains and we're at the barn again and I'm just using the all-in-one filter here and it's right the the darker the hard transition on the all-in-one is right along the horizon right along the tops of the mountain and then the soft goes down to about right here in this shot and you can see how much more detail we're getting into the barn at this point. So I was pretty excited to have that all-in-one out there. And I used it in multiple different spots just to see what would happen. This was on a workshop that I was teaching out there and I just used the all-in-one pretty much the whole time I was there. And, um, you know, you can see here, this is the uh, Snake River Overlook where Ansel Adams took his famous, famous shot. And to, to do this one, I, I brought that filter in. The hard transition goes right here, right over the ground a little bit. And then along the along the top of the mountains. It doesn't go into this little gap, but then that soft part of the filter starts down here and transitions into it. You can, if you look closely here, you can actually see the transition. So see the tonal values at the bottom of the mountain. They're a little bit brighter than the tonal values up here. Well, the light was exactly the same and the rock is the same color. So if the filter wasn't there, um, then it would be, uh, uh, this would be the same intensity as that. So. Yeah. Yeah, we were using that that all I on that workshop I lent out that all in one to quite a few people and uh, somebody else actually had a prototype of it uh, on that workshop too. So it got um it got got pretty silly at that. <laughs> we we had great conditions. Here's a here's another shot from that same workshop. <laughs> I mean, it was unreal. It was like that all the, the whole time that year it was just amazing uh, amazing light. So there was a little bit of smoke from the western forest fires in it and once it cleared out of the valley we had all these light beams everywhere. It was unreal. So here's another shot with the all-in-one. So the all-in-one is just like right across the horizon where the dark part the abrupt transition is right here. And then the softer spot just hangs down masking it so you don't see it up on the horizon. And then you can see that I did this as a demo. And the reason that I did it as a demo is so that you could see how bright the foreground grass got by just using the all-in-one filter in a backlit sunset situation in the mountains. It works surprisingly well. Every time I see this shot, I'm like, I can't, I can hardly believe that it works so well. So here we are into Death Valley. Um, and this is another situation where you end up having um, a very dark foreground. So I'm at sunset, the sun is setting behind the mountain range and this is in the artist palette. And I've hiked up into it just to get some of these weird minerals. I don't know what mineral this is, but it's actually blue in color, blue green. I mean, it looks just like it does in the photo. It's crazy. Um, so if you've never been to Death Valley, it, I highly recommend going at some point because it's um, one of the most unique, bizarre spots out there. Well, here we are again with the, the filter just right along the horizon and then the soft is hanging down below it, just transitioning up into it. Um, and it allows you to get that detail in the foreground. And I, I'm going to sound like a little bit of a broken record here because it's the same thing that happened here. And I'm just going to show you these shots here. This is out on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And I wanted to show you different types of mountains because the light in the Blue Ridge Parkway is considerably different than it is uh, in the Tetons because in the Tetons, you're down below the mountain range looking up at it. You're on the flat plains uh, in the Rift Valley looking up at the mountains. But out in the Blue Ridge Parkway or the Smokies, you're always up high at an overlook looking down into the ridge lines as they um, spread out to the horizon. Uh, and I found that it worked just fine out there too. So uh, it's the same kind of thing. You put that hard uh, part of the filter here, let the soft hang down below the horizon. It masks it extremely well so that you can get um, bright foregrounds as well. And then, uh, you know, after we, we made these prototypes, um, 
I was able to use them in some of the similar spots where I was stacking the filters previously. And I found that it works even better. So out in the Badlands, it was working even better than what I was doing when I was combining the filters. Uh, I think this is probably one of the best sunset shots that I've ever seen, or one of the best sunsets I've ever seen out in the Badlands. Um, and it was actually on a workshop as well uh, that I was teaching. It was a night photography workshop. So what we would do is we would go out and we shoot sunset, and then we would shoot until like two or three in the morning, um, shooting the Milky Way in both the Badlands and at Devil's Tower. Um, and <laughs> I'll tell you, everybody got unbelievable shots from this sunset. You could It was 360 degrees around you, all the way overhead. You could point your camera any direction. You could actually just drop your camera, have it accidentally go off and end up with a great shot. Uh, it was un unbelievable. Um, and here's out in the Blue Ridge, just a kind of a farm field. So, you know, more examples of where you could use this and where it comes in handy. It's not just limited to those places that I tested. I tried to test it in as many as I could. Uh, so here's another canoe shot that you can see. This will be on a cover of uh, Paragus's magazine this, um, this spring. Nice. Yeah, that's fun. Uh, and then this is this is actually another spot that this was on a workshop as well. So I have a lot of workshop images in here. Um, and this was unbelievable, but we were all filtering through so everybody could get a canoe shot. So this is my this is my personal canoe. I um, North Star Canoe. I, I'm good buddies with all the people at North Star Canoe, and they make great canoes. So I go down and give lectures at Canoe Copia and help them out with their booth and. Um, they give me some canoes now and then. So they uh, uh, gave me this canoe. I photograph it and um, use it on workshops. And this red is just beautiful on it. So uh, oftentimes if you come on a workshop up in uh, Cook County, I'll throw a canoe on for a sunset one night. And that's what we were doing here. Ed wants to know, are you using CPOL on the water shots? Um, no, I'm not using a polarizer. Most of the time I'm not using a polarizer on them. Every now and then, yeah, and that would be um, on, on, I can't think of actually one shot where I've used a polarizer in this presentation. So yeah, I'm just trying to think if there's any. If I see one, I'll, I'll mention it, but typically I don't. Not when I'm using ND grads, I typically don't use polarizers. Um, so it's just, I don't know, I just don't do it. Right. Uh, but I've seen shots that are cool. So if you have that kind of setup where you can use, um, you know, a, a polarizer with your ND grads, uh, you can get some cool shots that way. Here we are with the combo. So, so this is an example of the combo with a five stop more slow. And I find that I tend to use the five stop more slow when I'm using ND grads, just because I use those at sunrise and sunset. And once you're using that 10 stop, you're getting out to like five to eight minute long exposures. And with the five stop, you're in into the 15 seconds to um, 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds, somewhere in that range. And I, I get really anxious at sunrise and sunset because the conditions change very quickly. Um, so I don't want to tie myself up for five to eight minutes taking a picture uh, without having a guarantee that it's going to look good. I would rather spend 30 seconds and then... Uh, look at it and then be able to recompose or whatever I need to do. Um, so I tend to use the five stop more. And do you make your camera adjustments like the histogram before or after the all-in-one filter is applied? So with the all-in-one, you can just put it on and put it in place, get it set, and you're good to go. Uh, your camera will read right through it. Uh, no issues at all for metering and histogram. Uh, where you run into problems is when you add like a 10 stop more slow, uh, then your histogram is going to stop working. Uh, but if you're using like the all in one or any of the ND grads um, from Singray, you don't have to worry about it. it the, the camera meters through them and the histogram works perfectly with the filter on. So now we go out to Death Valley. This was a fun one. So Buddy and I flew out just for a long weekend, one year, and uh, slept in the back of the car sometimes, uh, which was not ideal because he snored. And uh, hopefully he's on and, and heard that. But uh, here it is with the all-in-one, so the dark sky, and then the transition just comes down into the dunes. Uh, and this was a legit sandstorm, so about... Uh, maybe eight minutes after this picture was taken, we got hammered by a sandstorm and we were 
I don't know how, maybe 10, 15 minutes from the car. And there's just like all this sand whipping up around us. The wind was blowing at like 20, 30 miles per hour. And visibility went from perfectly clear, as you see in this shot, to hardly being able to see where you're walking at all. Um, just like that. Just And we saw it come across. Uh, and I've never been in a sandstorm before. And we saw it coming across the dunes at us. And I, was, and I was like, what's that? Hey, Jim, what does that look like? And we couldn't figure it out until it hit us. And and then we just got, uh, you know, sandblasted for a while running back to the car. And here's another example of it uh, with the bright foreground. And that bright foreground is going to be able to capture your viewer's attention. And then this line just leads them out. Uh, and this was also a combo with that five stop more slow in order to smooth out the water on both sides of the breakwater here. I've also used it um, in panoramic shots. So this is down in... Um, this is down in Dubuque, Iowa, looking over the Mississippi River. So this is Lock and Dam, I think number nine, nine or 11. I can't remember. I think it's a nine. I should know I grew up there, uh, but I don't remember. And, and same thing. So we're just putting it right at the horizon and then having it down a little bit and then panning. And the reason that I switched, so I started this originally using a three-stop reverse because I didn't figure that I would need the all-in-one. But after I did my first pan, oh, I looked in and I didn't have any detail in the... Um, the Army Corps of Engineer buildings down below or in the lock and dam system. And then after I put that all in one on there, there was enough detail uh, that came into it that I was able to pull it up um, a little more in Lightroom so that we have a nice bright foreground in this uh, shot. So now uh, this is just a couple more uh, shots over water here of what you can do uh, with it. So this is a project I'm doing every um, New Year's Day. I go out and I shoot the same shot, uh, same composition or as close as I can get to it. And here's an example with the all-in-one. And then this is what I did this morning. So I was actually out on Lake Superior shooting this morning for sunrise and didn't think I was going to get a good one. Um, the sun showed up a little late and the color all happened after the sun popped up on the horizon. And if I was, if I just had the three stop reverse would be, uh, I, I think this wouldn't have turned out very nice. So having the all in one here, darkened that sky down and um, made a really cool shot. So I was psyched to have it. I also used the, uh, on both these shots, I used the five stop more slow uh, filters so that you can see the combo of them. We have a trick question here for you, maybe. Any examples where this filter does not work well, like more sharply jagged mountains on the horizon or a seascape with rock stacks? So what, you know, like, uh, I, I don't, I didn't include any in the presentation, um, but with the uh, sea stacks uh, or the, you know, the sea stacks, which is, if you're not familiar with what the stacks would be, um, they're, they're like abrupt rocks that rise out of the ocean uh, and they're not connected to land. So it just looks like pillars of rocks. And what ends up happening in that case um, is that the filter darkens the sea stack uh, quite a bit from the horizon up. And then if your sea stack extends down below the horizon, it would be brighter. But the cool thing is the soft kind of trend, that little, that soft transition transitions from uh, no filter to the horizon where you would have the abrupt filter and it kind of hides it on the sea stack. So uh, I actually have a shot of an island, I believe, don't quote me on that. Uh, I can't remember if I left it in at the very last slide or not, but I have used it with islands uh, and, it, in, and it works just fine. It, it actually looks really nice. Um, with really abrupt mountains, I would think that you might be better served, um, you know, using like either a couple of softs together or one of those mountain view filters, which are the veed ones. Um, I don't, I don't have a picture of one in the slideshow, but you can look at it on Singray's website and they have the V. Uh, so you can put them into the gap between the two mountains and darken that area. They're, they're pretty cool. Um, so I'd definitely uh, check those out if you're shooting that kind of situation a lot. So now I just want to show how to use this filter, um, and it, it's just you just use it exactly the same as any other ND grad. So you're gonna you're gonna have a filter holder on the front of your lens, and you slide that filter into it, and then you're gonna move it up and down until the hard transition is right at the horizon. 
Um, so you want that hard transition at the horizon, then the soft automatically goes down below it. The easy way to do this is as you're trying to figure out where, um, where the transition is, is if you rotate that filter back and forth aggressively, uh, you'll start to see it. And sometimes with this filter, you'll actually see both transitions. So you'll see that the, the start of the soft and the, and the hard transition, but usually you're just gonna see the hard transition. So it's really easy to place. And I have a video here um, that will start up uh, just so we can see it. So see how it's pivoting. What you want is you want to look for this pivot point. And as I'm, I'm going back and forth, we can see the pivot point is like close to the horizon. And that's exactly where we want it. And I just moved it down here so that you can see it in the wrong spot. So that's way too low. And that's going to be visible in the scene. So we're going to move it back up until it's right at the horizon. And this might be just a touch low there. Yep. So I moved it up again. You're just looking to get that pivot point right there exactly on the horizon. And once it's on the horizon, you know that it's placed uh, extremely well. In this shot, I didn't notice the soft transition to the hard. I just noticed the hard transition. But every now and then, when I've been out in the field, you actually see both of the transitions. But it's not all the time. So when you're in the mountains, it's a it's slightly different. Uh, and I don't have a video for this one, but it's slightly different. Instead of putting it right here on the horizon, what you're going to do is you're just going to run it across the top of the mountains. If there's like higher peaks, I just tried to average it out. So some of the high peaks will get covered and some of the low peaks won't. And that's where the soft filter actually comes in down below or the soft uh, part of the all-in-one comes in, it transitions that. So you're just trying to average it out here. And you're still gonna do all that rotating back and forth and, and everything like that. And then you can get creative. So this is out in Death Valley um, in the sand dunes. And because of the, the slope of the mountain, so the way that I'm shooting this is I'm shooting kind of down range. So even though the mountains might be a similar height down here, they're gonna look smaller just because of perspective. And instead of putting it straight across in this instance, I just took the filter and ran it down along the horizon. And then that soft starts somewhere down here and then transitions up to the heart right on the horizon. And that allowed for these very bright dunes to show up. So it's not, you know, don't get stuck at thinking that you always have to have your ND grads and, uh, right, at right along the horizon. If the mountains that are at an angle, you certainly could do that. Uh, even in some cases, a, an angled shoreline, if you angled your, your ND grad, that's gonna work as well. And this, it's not just the all-in-one that that works with, that's any ND grad can be used that way and can work that way. So I got a little bit of a shameless self promo here. Um, so this is, uh, I do, so so I am a you know professional photographer, but the main way that I make my living now is through teaching workshops. So I teach uh, anywhere from 12, 16 a year, everywhere from Death Valley to Smoky Mountains, anywhere in between. I do a lot of them on the North Shore of Lake Superior where I live because it's unbelievably beautiful. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can just go to my website and it's brianhansel.com. If you're into YouTube, uh, I just started a YouTube channel not too long ago, uh, and it's YouTube slash Brian Hansel. If you're into that, please subscribe. I appreciate it. Um, there's some funny videos on there, I think, and also educational. Uh, on Facebook, I'm at Brian, I'm at Brian Hansel Photography, and then Instagram, I'm just at Brian Hansel. And here's that shot that I was talking about earlier with the island in it. So I've shot this, there's three islands up here that look real similar to this and I shoot them all the time. They're one of my favorite subjects up here. And using the all-in-one filter, I just put it right along the horizon like you normally would do it. And there's always part of the island that's down below. But because you have that soft transition that's down below the horizon, it, it hides that real abruptness. It's, um, it's really wild how, how it does it and it works. Uh, if your C-stack like started all the way down here, it might not look as natural. In that case, you would probably you want to use a soft filter instead of this. I mean, this wouldn't replace uh, all of your other filters. There's going to be situations where every filter uh, is the best filter. Uh, but I've, I'm finding that I use this filter more and more often than my other ones now, especially, um, especially around water, uh, just because it works real well. Um, and I can't, you know, I didn't go into any mountains last year just because I didn't do any traveling. So I can't wait to get back into the mountains now that we've finalized the design. I'm super psyched about this filter. Uh, 
So yeah, every one of these shots, except for the night sky one and this one, um, were shot were shot with that filter. Uh, the waterfall here was shot with the Brian Hansel waterfall polarizer. So that's the other um, filter that I helped design with Singray, and it's designed to get you a nice silky water even in brighter situations like this. Um, so so yeah, and then night sky stuff is uh, we just got. Where I live, we just got an international dark sky um, designation called an international sanctuary. And once all of the parts are uh, done getting certified, it will be the largest international dark sky dark sky sanctuary in the world. Um, and so this is uh, it's amazing here for for night skies. It's unbelievable. So. Awesome. Yeah. Other than that, uh, uh, are there any questions that we still have or comments or anything? We do have a few questions here. If anyone out there still has questions, put them in there and we'll get them answered. Um, Les wants to know any difficulty with nodal point determination on panos with filters in front of the lens? Uh, nope, uh, no difference at all. So as long as you find your no parallax point in your lens or nodal point, whatever you wanna call it, um, which is the entrance pupil of the lens generally, uh, yeah, as long as you have that point found, the filters don't mess with the point at all. So it's still the same. So you can use all of your same equipment without doing any adjustments at all. Um, and then John said that was excellent. Thank you. Robert wants to know what size filter do you use on your Nikon Trilogy lens? 14 to 24, 24 to 70, 70 to 200? Yeah, so the, with the Z system, um, I don't own the whole trilogy. I didn't do the 24728 just because I don't shoot that um, focal length very often. Uh, so I just have the 24 to 70 F4 version, which is like a 72 millimeter filter. The 70 to 200 is a 77 millimeter filter. And the 14 to 24 is like 116 or something. I don't know. I don't have any filters for that lens yet, except there's a filter holder, uh, an adapter. So you can actually put 100 millimeter filters on the front of it for um, the rectangular filters. Uh, so there's a couple companies making adapters so that you can put filter holders on the front. Um, so that's pretty cool. I was afraid that when I got that lens, I was going to have to switch out to all 150 millimeter rectangular um, filters, which are just huge. And I wasn't looking forward to carrying the huge filters. So when I saw that they could make a hundred millimeter filter holder, I like bought it the, the day it was available. <laughs> Another one just came out today and I actually just bought that this afternoon. Cause now I'm going to see which one's better. Um, so, so I'll be able to make a better recommendation uh, after, um, after I get the second one and able to compare them, we're actually, uh, the first one I got, I'm not gonna say the brand, but the first one I got, we're, we're uh, a buddy and I right now are getting 3D printed parts for it. Cause we, we like it generally, it's a really sweet filter holder, but there's some things that we wanna tweak on it. So uh, his son-in-law does 3D printing. So we actually have the filter holders and filters down in his son-in-law's place and we're 3D printing stuff right now. So, yeah. So this might be a question for my Singray counterparts. Any plans to make this filter two to three stops density at the top? So if my, if my counterparts out there have an answer to that, um, I can tell you though, um, Singray will make a custom filter. So if that's something that you want uh, created for you, give a call to the office. Um, and I, I, I can't say how much it would cost, but I've been told it costs less to have a custom filter made than one would think. So give a call to the office uh, and you might be surprised what they can make for you. Um, Gary wants to know, what's the name of the place with the darkest night skies? Yeah, so um, the area, the general area is Cook County. So uh, Cook County, Minnesota, which is in the Arrowhead region of Minnesota. And um, what they ended up doing, the two, the three biggest parts of the new International Dark Sky Sanctuary will be the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness, um, Quetico um, Provincial Park in Canada, and then Voyagers National Park. Um, so those are the big three. And then there's two other ones that I'm not sure if they've gotten their designations or not yet. So, uh, but it will be five total parks uh, that are all, uh, they're all join each other and once all five it will be the biggest international dark sky sanctuary in the world so it's unbelievable up here so if you know anything about night skies there's a rating called the Bortle rating 
and they rate the dark skies from from one to nine with nine being like inner city brightness and one being the darkest places in the world in cook county we have a one a border one area and actually the, the picture that you're looking at right now on the screen um, this is a selfie uh, this is in that Bortle One area, uh, so it's extremely dark up there. I, I do um, night sky workshops, and one of the coolest things I'll remember is a guy from out east. He'd never seen dark skies before because he'd lived out east his whole life, um, and there's just not dark skies out east. Yeah, and it wasn't even true dark yet, so we were still in dusk, and we get out at the parking lot that's near this spot, and... Um, uh, he looks up at the sky and he's like, wow, it's really dark here. And it wasn't even true dark. It was still like 30 minutes from true dark. So it got even darker than that. But yeah, it's just, um, it's unbelievably dark. There's so many stars. You can see the Milky Way uh, with your eyes with no, you don't need anything. It just, it just, you just see it there. It's just so cool. We have a couple of folks, Tammy and Larry, who have been to your workshops before. Tammy says, you're not kidding. She's taken your dark sky classes and they are awesome. And Larry said he's attended a couple of your workshops and would recommend them to anyone. They were amazing experiences. So, Thanks, awesome. Tammy. Thanks, Larry. Appreciate it. You. Hope you guys are well. Um, is this filter optical glass or resin? Uh, so this is uh, optical quality resin. And does the filter come with a protective case or sleeve? Yeah, it ships with a really nice uh, protective kind of uh, foam padded sleeve. Um, looks like leather. Uh, it's kind of like a fox le leather on the outside. Yeah, it's really nice. Uh, so I, I would recommend that. But if you're going to get some filters, I would highly recommend getting a filter bag. And the one by Kinesis Gear is really sweet. So they make, a, they make my favorite one. Um, I would recommend getting that if you're going to get a bunch of filters. Right. And have you ever seen the Aurora from up there? Oh yeah, I can see the Aurora from my front yard. So okay. I just walk out on my porch and um, yeah, it was out the other night. Um, <laughs> so everybody's gonna laugh at me because everybody wants to see the Aurora. And uh, uh, the, the other morning I was out with the goal of doing Milky Way panos and the Northern Lights was out, and I was kind of, I was kind of mad about it because it was interfering with my Milky Way shots. They were just, the Northern Lights were so bright that it was washing out the, the Milky Way. So I, I shot a couple shots of the Northern Lights anyways. <laughs> but yeah, we get, them, we get them a lot. We're just coming out of a solar minimum, um, which means that they didn't happen very much. So over the next couple of years, we're gonna be moving to solar maximum. And so we should be getting Northern Lights events all the time. I remember the last solar maximum and it was it was like literally once a week we would get northern lights there was about four years maybe five years of night sky workshops where we would get northern lights at least one night there was one workshop by day three of northern lights everybody was saying they were sick of taking pictures of northern lights and they wanted to do something else <laughs> so yeah we see them we we, we get them a lot so Robert said the filter gives a great separation of foreground, midground, and distance. Yay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and then Lynn wanted to know what's the name of that filter holder again? Uh, which one? She didn't say. The... So, <laughs> what's in your bag? So the um, the company that for my favorite filter holder is one that's not made anymore, unfortunately. It was by a company named um, Sensei. And it was just awesome. Um, I've been trying out filter holders since then. So I've been buying a lot of filter holders or getting companies to, to send me some demos just so I know what to recommend. And I haven't found anything that I like as much as the Sensei one. Um, so if you can find like a used Sensei, that would be the way to go for sure. Um, that's my favorite. Yeah, she said she's looking for a holder for multiple filters. Yeah, I, I don't know. I just don't have a favorite one at this point. Um, there's issues with all of them. Um, well, I know Singray has a filter holder from Lee Filters on their website um, that that I think and I, there are lots of filter holders you can pick, but I know that's the one that's on the Singray website that they recommend. Um, yeah, that's a that's a good one. There's lots of options. Yeah, there's a ton of them out there. It's like the one for, so the two that are now made for this new Nikon Z 14 to 24, uh, Nissi makes one and Case makes one. So um, 
and I'm not going to say which one that I that I that we're making 3D parts for, but um, uh, yeah, we'll see. Getting creative. I think that's it for our questions tonight. Um, thank you so much to Brian for joining us tonight. Thank you to everyone who joined us on the webinar tonight. We are going to get a recording out. So if you missed anything, you can rewatch this and there'll be a link to information about this filter in that email that you get from us. So look for that email um, and then reach out to the office if you have any questions. And like I said, Brian, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. And thanks for everybody for coming. I appreciate it. And I hope you all have fun shooting out there. So it's great to great to talk with you. All right. Have a great night, everyone.